everyone and welcome to Boundless Dentistry. In this video, we'll talk about mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Although this is a rare carcinoma, but in terms of malignancies that are affecting the oral salivary glands, this is one of the most common malignancy that affects the oral salivary gland. So in this video, we'll talk about everything that is related to mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So let's get started. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma is a salivary gland carcinoma that affects salivary glands such as parotid gland, submandibular, sublingual and to some extent minor salivary glands are also affected by this malignancy. As you can see in this clinical picture, this is palate and as you can appreciate a swelling is present over here. So this malignancy has affected a minor salivary gland. So mucoepidermoid carcinoma does have an impact on the minor salivary glands. Now, if we talk about the different cells which are present in mucoepidermoid carcinoma, we have mucous cells, epidermoid cells and intermediate cells. Now, in terms of primary salivary gland malignancy, this is amongst the most common malignancy that affects the primary salivary glands, which includes our parotid, submandibular and sublingual glands. Now, although this is a rare malignancy, but the age range is wide. Most commonly, we see a peak of cases in terms of patient being aged around 20 years of age and 60 years of age now. If we talk about the locations where mucoepidermoid carcinoma attacks, or intraorally if we speak, so it can affect palate, cheeks, lips and tongue along with retromolar pad. However, if we talk about extraoral location of mucoepidermoid carcinoma, most frequently affects the parotid gland. Although the number of cases in both males and females is almost equal, but slightly greater number of cases are observed in female patient. As you can also see in this clinical picture, this is where the parotid gland is present and you can appreciate a large swelling which is present around the parotid gland. So one of the differential diagnoses can be mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Let's talk about what are the etiology which is responsible for mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Firstly, there are some genetic factors, some mutations which are passed along the family chain and that can increase the chances of a patient to suffer from mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Along with that, two other important causes which are associated with mucoepidermoid carcinoma are radiation. For example, the patient is being treated in head and neck region for some other cancer and that radiation or radiotherapy, even chemotherapy, both radiotherapy and chemotherapy for some primary cancer which is affecting the head and neck region, it can lead to mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So genetic factors, secondary to radiation and secondary to chemotherapy. These are the three factors, the three primary factors which are responsible for causing mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Now, if we talk about localization, primarily parotid gland is affected by mucoepidermoid carcinoma. However, palate, submandibular gland and can also be affected intraorally. So this is all about etiology and localization of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Generally, mucoepidermoid carcinoma is divided into two categories. There is low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma and high-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. But first, we'll talk about the general clinical features which can be appreciated in a patient who is suspectedly suffering from mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Most frequently, these patients are asymptomatic. As you can see in this clinical picture, this is the palate and a swelling is here uh, between the first and second. You can see molar, there is swelling over here. And we can suspect that there is some sort of abnormality which is present. So initially, patient will not feel any symptoms, for example, pain or discomfort. But as the swelling will gradually enlarge, then the patient will actually start to feel any symptoms of pain and discomfort, such as dysphagia and having speech difficulty along with pain now. The clinical features mainly depend on the size of the tumor and grade. For example, either it's um, low grade or high grade. Now, this mucoepidermoid carcinoma can also mimic a cyst uh, mucus draining cutaneous fistula as well now. As I've mentioned, there are two types of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. There is low grade and there is high grade. So we'll talk about both of these two grades in more detail. Firstly, if you talk about low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma's clinical features, as you can appreciate, this is a clinical picture and you can see this is of palate and some swelling is present over here as indicated by this arrow. 
so in low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma these swellings gradually enlarge they are very slowly growing in nature and slowly and over period of years they start to enlarge but slowly the mass as you can see here palate it will generally be painless along with that they do usually do not exceed more than 5 cm in the widest diameter now if we talk about more detail about low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma they are not encapsulated as we can appreciate histologically along with that if we appreciate histologically there will be numerous cystic cavities these swellings if we palpate it they will feel to be fluctuant and lastly since these swellings they are small in um, nature so we can also mistake it for mucosal so this is all about the general clinical features of low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma now on the other hand if we talk about high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma's clinical feature again you can appreciate that this is the clinical picture of a patient showing pallet mm -hmm. and as the arrow indicates you can see that there is a large swelling and that swelling is appearing to be a bit necrotic it's, it's large in nature as compared to low grade so high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma the growth will be rapid and if for example a parotid gland is affected by mucoepidermoid carcinoma facial nerve can also be damaged and this can lead to facial palsy along with that patients who are suffering from high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma they can feel symptoms like trismus which is difficulty in opening mouth dysphagia that is difficulty in, sw in swallowing some ulceration as you can see in this clinical picture we can appreciate some ulceration which is present along with that there can be some numbness of the adjacent regions because the nerves which are associated with this pathology now since this is a high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma it grows rapidly so it can affect lymph nodes which are adjacent to the area which is draining this area basically and uh, they basically it's the cervical lymph nodes which are affected along with that if we do not manage this disease at a proper time earlier time and as it has not progressed further if it is progressed further it can lead to distant metastasis to lungs bones and brain most commonly one of the most important ways to confirm our diagnosis is histopathology now histopathology basically gives us the definitive diagnosis whether the patient is actually suffering from mucoepidermoid carcinoma or not what do we do is that we basically take a biopsy of the region and then of that biopsy we do histopathology now the histopathology is a bit different for low grade and high grade so we'll talk about both of the histologies of the two grades separately however if you talk about some general features you can appreciate in this histological picture you can appreciate there are epidermoid cells intermediate cells we have some mucocytes as well epidermoid and this is the connective tissue so histologically basically how do we grade this um, mucoepidermoid carcinoma we grade this on the basis of histology we look for cyst formation cytoplasmic atypia we look for the number of mucus intermediate and epidermal cells which are present and then we try to analyze the growth pattern by observing the histological slide firstly talking about the histology of low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma there are increased number of mucus cells as you can appreciate in this histological picture also you can appreciate that there is increased cystic spaces as you can see there is numerous cystic spaces available here however intermediate cells and epidermoid cells will be less in number as compared to mucus cells along with that there will be decrease in cellular atypia so this is the features that you should keep in mind because in high grade mucoepidermoid carcinomas histological slide all of this will be reversed so this is all about how do we actually look at the histology of low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma and this is very important because the histology gives us the definitive diagnosis talk about high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma histological picture as i've talked before there it's the complete opposite of low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma there will be increased epidermoid cells increased intermediate cells however the mucus cell will be decreased as you can also appreciate in this histological picture however also you can see that these cystic spaces are decreased mm -hmm. as compared to the low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma so there will be decreased cystic spaces now since this is high grade and it is aggressive in nature 
there will be increased cellular achapia. So these are the histological features which you should keep in mind and you should be able to differentiate between low grade and high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. We have suspected that the patient might actually be suffering from mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So what are the investigations that we can go in order to reach our definitive diagnosis? Firstly, we can also go for fine needle aspiration biopsy. However, histology, as I've talked before, that is the gold standard for actually diagnosing whether the patient is actually suffering from mucoepidermoid carcinoma or not. Sometimes we can also go for RT-PCR and along with that, we can also go for CT scan because CT scan basically tells us if there is actually mucoepidermoid carcinoma and it also tells us how much further it has spread throughout the body. Now, moving on towards differential diagnosis, we can suspect cyclometaplasia, squamous cell carcinoma and adenomatoid carcinoma. So these are the three pathologies which can mimic features of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So how do we actually reach our definitive diagnosis? On the basis of investigation and most commonly histology. Before talking about management, there are some factors which we should keep in mind and that gives us an idea as to how will the outcomes of the patient will be after they have been treated now. Low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma has favorable outcomes because the disease is localized, there is no distant metastasis and it can be easily managed. However, if you talk about high grade, the outcomes are poor along with survival because it's an invasive tumor, it has rapid growth and it has spread throughout the body. So since it has spread throughout the body, it's locally invasive, so it's difficult to manage. Therefore, the outcomes are poor and along with that survival. So generally, low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, patients have good outcomes. However, for high-grade, the outcomes are generally poor. Talking about management of mucoepidermoid carcinoma, as you can see in this pictures, this is the CD scan and as you can appreciate that there is a tumor over here and clinically you can appreciate the tumor which is present over here. So this is, this now has been diagnosed as mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So we can divide it on the basis of location as to how do we treat it. So first, if you talk about mucoepidermoid carcinoma of the parotid salivary gland, we can go for conservative excision because we have to preserve facial nerve because if we damage that facial nerve, it will lead to facial uh, nerve palsy and it can also lead to Frey syndrome as well. Now, if we talk about submandibular gland mucoepidermoid carcinoma, so in that case we have we go for complete excision. Moreover, in cases of high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, we have to go for radical neck dissection in order to remove the lymph nodes which have been affected by the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And after all the surgical treatment have been performed for the patient, lastly we then decide whether the patient needs chemo and radiotherapy or not. But in cases of high-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, most likely post-operative chemotherapy and radiotherapy is required. So, in this video, we talked about everything that is related to mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Starting from its introduction, then talking about etiology, localization, general clinical features of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Then we talked specifically about low-grade and high-grade mucoepidermoids, clinical features, investigation, histology, differential diagnosis. And then finally, we talked about how do we actually manage such cases which have been presented to us who are suffering from mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So I hope this video was useful for you. And if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe and press the bell icon. Thank you for watching this video. See you next time.